Hello, very warm welcome to the Daily Politics on Friday. And usually, you know this, it's a quieter day when it comes to grabbing political headlines. Not so this week. The dramatic arrest of the shadow immigration minister Damien Green over alleged leaks from the Home Office has certainly put the cat among the pigeons right here in Westminster. Last night, he defended his actions. I was astonished to have spent more than nine hours today under arrest for doing my job. I emphatically deny that I have done anything wrong. Once loved, but now forgotten, did this week's introduction of a new top rate of tax in the pre-budget report mark the death of new Labour? And as ever, our very own Ross is here with the rundown of the political charts. Oh, I'll be summing up the week's news, but I'll also be keeping an eye out for any search warrant-wielding police officers trying to get into Parliament. Ah, poor Ross out in the cold. And with me in the warm for the whole programme today, two think tank big brains. We've got Jessica Asato of Progress and Douglas Murray of the Centre for Social Cohesion. Very good morning to you. Um, let's go straight to that arrest of the Tory shadow immigration minister, Damien Green, over a series of leaks from the Home Office. Now, the news broke quite late last night. Mr Green has been defending his actions. And in the last few minutes, the Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, has spoken on the matter. She's rejected Tory suggestions that the government had any involvement in Mr Green's arrest. The Metropolitan Police have been completely clear that that arrest happened without either ministerial involvement or authorisation. And actually, I think the, some of the allegations that are being flung around are frankly disreputable. And actually, I believe in the operational independence of the police, and that's the principle on which I am acting at the moment. And we will be looking in more detail at this story a little later in the programme when we will be joined by former Shadow Home Secretary David Davis. Um, but let's, let's talk to you both about this because it is astonishing. We had people going through archives trying to find anything like this before. Uh, of course, there was uh, the arrest in the Cash for Honours case, but nothing on this level of this prominence. What do you think is going on here? No, it's unprecedented as far as I can see. Um, it's a very unusual step to take apart from anything else um, for the, uh, the uh, Home Secretary Jackie Smith to talk about. She, you, you notice she was careful not to say that she didn't know about it in advance. Uh, whether she knew about it, uh, whether she authorised or not, is really uh, in some ways not, not the point. It's the idea that uh, the police and uh, the, even talking about counter-terror units would be stepping into effectively normal uh, political discourse. I mean, uh, you know, ministers and shadow ministers run on leaks, on counter-leaks. You know, they get information like journalists and they use it for their advantage. I don't think there's anything unprecedented in what's been given uh, to the uh, shadow immigration minister. But the way in which he's been treated is certainly unprecedented. Well, I mean, it, it, it's interesting because I don't know whether you heard Phil Wallace today on the radio uh, earlier this morning, but he was he was being quite sphinxian actually saying ah masters and and you know the the kind of flurried speculation in some senses to to actually kind of die down and, and make sure that we're not kind of making a big it's, it's deal of this it's not going to die down though is it? <laughs> I mean, it's not gonna, nine hours of questioning yeah. he's back to talk to the police in february this isn't going anywhere is it whatever the basis of the uh, accusations against him that uh, that uh, Phil Willis was so sphinxian about. Uh, I can't believe that they are so serious uh, that uh, a minister, a shadow minister, has to be arrested and taken into question like that. This is not the normal course uh, of politics. This is not how things are done. There are much, much more light-handed measures in which the government, police, anyone else could have found out what went on. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I wonder, the politicisation of this happened very, very quickly. Um, mm. And there is the suggestion that this could be, for Ian Blair, the outgoing head of the Met, yes a last kick in the shin to a mayor he clearly doesn't get on with, yes. who lost him his job. Does that hold any water? Surely this is bigger than all that kind of pettiness, isn't it? Oh, you can never underestimate the pettiness of politics and the pettiness of political uh, fallouts. I'd heard that uh, rumour about uh, Ian Blair. It is certainly uh, strange timing uh, that uh, on his last day uh, this would happen. Mm, one wonders, Jessica, if it was his first day in the job, whether this could have happened. Well, I think it's very important not to actually accuse the police of being overly political. In fact, Ian Blair has done a very good job uh, in London of actually um, getting crime levels down. And I think that, you know, to, to cast spurious allegations, you know, on the outgoing commissioner is, is not really where, where this debate should be. I think the most important thing is, is for us to see the, the investigation take its course. Right. And to, let me just very briefly, the, the whole idea of leaks 
-hmm. And are they necessarily damaging? I and mean, I was looking at the, the history of leaks. And if it weren't for leaks, Churchill would never have been the leader of this country going into the war. I mean, he, he got a leak straight yes. from the Home Office yes. about troop movements in Germany, and everyone, that's why he could have... Everyone's always against leaks unless they're saying something that they like. Uh, the government will always condemn a leak unless it happens to be something that's in line with government policy. Does, but it's Opposition it's parties it's love it. If it I mean, you've got the Churchillian example, but it is subversive, isn't it? Well, I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, journalists, you know, need to do their job of, of actually finding out what's going on in politics. And, and if it's in the public interest and it's a leak, then, you know, it should be out there. Um, but in the present case, I think the most important thing is, as I say, that um, the police are allowed to, you know, keep their independence and that, that politicians you know, who, who haven't been informed aren't kind of drawn into something that is, that is nothing to do with them. Well, I know we're going to talk about this. I know you're bursting with more uh, thoughts and ideas. And hopefully, as I say, we're going to be joined by David Davis to continue this conversation. Now, though, in the aftermath of the pre-budget report and the new top rate of income tax um, that was announced, some commentators have been rushing to proclaim the death of new Labour. So has the movement that has dominated British politics for the last 10 years really bitten the dust? Or are the reports of its demise greatly exaggerated? We sent our reporter Anne Alexander to investigate. Enjoying the spoils of new Labour success on election night 1997. But 11 years on from that historic victory, are we now witnessing the death of one of Britain's most successful political ideologies? Killing off Labour's image as a high-tax, fiscally irresponsible party is what made new Labour electable. Now, Alice Darling's tax raid on the rich in the pre-budget report marks a turn away from one of the key ideas that new Labour was founded on. Many in the party now believe the project is dead and buried, and they feel little remorse about it. Well, I think New Labour, as an ideology, has gone. Uh, as an image, they may try and preserve it, but I think it began to die when Tony Blair went, because it was very much associated with Tony Blair. I may say I was never New Labour myself, and uh, made that very clear even when I was selected as a candidate you know, 15 years ago. The architects of New Labour saw the light and repositioned the party to occupy the centre ground, winning the faith of the middle classes. And followers who've worshipped at the church of New Labour for 14 years, despite the change in policy, still believe in the project. It's absolute nonsense to say that New Labour's dead. You know, central to New Labour was the idea that we had to understand the way the world was changing, and then we had to think about how we applied our core values, our traditional beliefs, to completely change circumstances. That's what we did 15 years ago when we created New Labour. And that's exactly what Gordon Brown is doing now in the completely different circumstances when a sort of financial tsunami is hitting the world. But some unconverted observers claim it is the end of an era. I think New Labour is dead, or at least on its last legs. There were two founding principles of New Labour, fiscal responsibility, or prudence as Gordon Brown called it, and aspiration. And both of those were dealt a heavy blow by the pre-budget report, particularly the top rate of tax for um, high earners, which was something that Tony Blair always resisted, uh, and also the tax rises across the board. The high priest of New Labour, Peter Mandelson, has been brought back from the dead and it's understood he had a hand in the new tax policy. So, is it too early to say, here lies New Labour, 1994 to 2008? Anne Alexander reporting and we're joined now from Manchester by the chairman of the parliamentary Labour Party, Tony Lloyd. Are you wearing a black armband this morning, Mr Lloyd? Well, to, to be honest with you, most of my constituents will be astonished at the, at the, at the question. The, uh, what they look to this Labour government for now, as they did over the last 11 years, is governance, uh, that old phrase, for the many, not the few. But actually what's very important is, is a government that recognises that where markets work, markets should be allowed to work, but where markets fail, as they've failed recently in the current economic crisis, that the government uses the power of government to underwrite the public interest, I mean, and, and that's I, what we've seen. I think it was put very succinctly in Anne's film. Um, there were two foundations to New Labour, prudence, 
was one strut, aspiration was another. Both of these have crumbled beneath your feet and what you've done is you've created a big puddle of clear blue water to fall into. No, I think the clear blue water, if you really want to look at the, uh, at the, at the rail that is on the ground at the moment, is um, a, con a Conservative Party which, by demanding inaction in the present economic crisis, when we've got top Tory toffs like Andrew Lansley saying the recession can be good for us, um, it's very reminiscent of the, the old Thatcherite Tories. Um, unemployment is a price worth, worth paying. And people in a city like Manchester, but all over this country, don't want to go back to that old Toryism. I think what they do want from uh, th this Labour government, new Labour, old Labour, um, any old Labour, is, is decisive action of the kind we've seen in recent weeks and using um, the power of the, the government to, to make sure that uh, the economic system is, is, is strong and sound. That's one of the principles that uh, Labour came into power on in 97. And making sure as well that we protect those most vulnerable in our society, pensioners, right. Um, those in need of, uh, of, of different kinds of assistance, it, whether it, it be is, financial or, or public it spending. It is very interesting that you're talking about the Tories returning to the Thatcher days, because many would say, actually, what you've done now is you've returned Labour to those very same days. Whatever the consensus you might have worked so hard to build was, it's smashed to pieces now. And you've, you've got Ken Livingston, one who has been latterly welcomed into your fold, saying as much. Well, you're working very hard to, to construct this debate round whether it's... it's uh, the death of new labour or not, and I admire the, those great efforts. But look, the simple reality is that this government has to operate in the interests of, of the people of this country. Now that does mean um, trying to make sure that the economy is strong, very much a core philosophy of, of what Labour did uh, 11 years ago when we came into power. It's making sure that um, as the, the economy goes through this difficult time, that we protect people in society who are most vulnerable. That's something that Labour has always sought to do from 97 onwards, but long before that. So the consistency of, uh, of, of Labour's values um, and putting them into practice in, in today's circumstances, I think, is, is there for all to see. Well, this, isn't a, this isn't a spiritual debate. It's about very, very practical politics. And repeating what I said earlier, mm. ordinary people all over this country will perhaps not really buy into this well, argument. I don't know. I, don't Labour, know. I mean, ordinary people have been polled for the Times today, and mm. we can see that the popularity of Mr Brown has taken a sharp dive today. Uh, when asked the question, is he the best leader for right now, um, his popularity has fallen from 52 to 42 per cent. Um, Douglas Murray, I mean, what, what we've heard from Mr Lloyd is that this is not a spiritual debate, um, but it isn't, it, isn't it exactly that? When you have a party like New Labour, which spiritually reconstructed itself in the Church of Blair, isn't that exactly what it is? Well, I mean, the, the Blair, the Blair um, image on New Labour mattered a lot, and I think New Lab Labour has really been dead since uh, Mr Blair left uh, office. Certainly it would be, I think, uh, bad if Labour went back to the bad old days of old Labour. We, I think we just saw a, a hint of it with a reference to top Tory toffs. Uh, I hope Labour doesn't go back into that kind of direction of uh, subclass warfare. Um, what uh, The reason why Mr Brown's uh, opinion pollings have taken such a knock is the simple fact that people used to trust him on the economy, prudence and all of these terms he threw around seem to have been now themselves thrown out of the window. Of course, the world is in a financial uh, crisis, but this country is perhaps particularly badly prepared for that crisis. Uh, I don't know the Conservatives are going to pick up many votes from that because Mr Brown's uh, alleged uh, handling of the economy has not been deemed good, but then I'm not sure Mr Cameron looks in any better position to handle it. Well, what, what, the most important voice, I, I suppose, that voices that we were hearing is that this consensus might be crumbling as a result of what happened with PBR. Jessica, what do you make of that? Well, I think that actually it's an outrageous claim that, that New Labour is dead, and actually the founding tenets of New Labour were economic efficiency and social justice um, not, not prudence and, and aspiration as that was kind of reconvened there in, in your film. Um, and actually you can see both of those in operation in the PBR. Economic efficiency in extraordinary times. We are increasing borrowing, but that is in order to get the economy moving again, as is many other global economies. Um, secondly, we are actually focusing the borrowing and spending that we're putting in place on the worst off. So you're going to see the biggest increase, for example, in the basic state pension since 2001. There's going to be a massive increase in the winter, winter fuel payment for, for pensioners and those who are least well off. Um, and actually the, the money that is actually going to go into people's pockets under £40,000 will actually help them to get the economy going because they are the ones who are most likely to spend okay. it. If anything, it's the Conservatives who want to say that New Labour is dead because actually they've lost against New Labour three times in a row. Okay, well, um, your thoughts are always welcome on this as anything 
anything else that we're talking about in this programme. Thank you very much to Tony Lloyd for, for being with us. It is now time for our regular rundown of the political charts. Let's cross over to the cold outside Parliament. It's Ross. It's Ross in the rain. And Anita, let's just get one thing clear, because there are a lot of police around here. Some of them may even be listening. So just to be clear, there isn't a single piece of leaked information in what you're about to see. It's all out there in the public domain. And I don't want to be arrested, thanks very much. Uh, BBC.co.uk forward slash politics. The top five stories of this week here in our top of the political pops. <laughs> At five, one minister says the government's going to hold banks' feet to the fire to make sure they get lending. Peter Mandelson had a meeting with some bankers this week. He pulled this slightly cross-face as he left, but he didn't torture any of them as far as we know. Love him, love him, love him! This man's potty. At four, Gordon Brown's already got one security minister, Lord West. Here he is. Former minister and NATO boss Lord Robertson says he needs another one, which sounds just a little bit like a job application. At three, supermarkets are going to halve the number of plastic bags they use by next Easter. That's not just because they'll have half the number of customers by next Easter. No, it's because they're hiding the plastic bags under counters where people can't see them, which is quite clever. Do you fancy a little bit of head banging at home? Go on, give me a bit of that. At two, it's the new shadow immigration minister. Damien Green has been arrested and released on bail by police investigating alleged leaks. I was astonished to have spent more than nine hours today under arrest for doing my job. I emphatically deny that I have done anything wrong. And there's only one left to play. That's the big number one. And at one, good news from the Chancellor, if you've got a leaking roof. We did fix the many roofs that needed fixing. If your roof's fine, though, you'll want to know about the economy. This lot want to get a spending with a VAT cut, which will make things very slightly cheaper, apart from the things they're keeping really quite expensive, like cigarettes and alcohol and petrol and taxes. Thank you very much, Ross. Well, um, Jessica, there are some mixed messages coming out today. On the one hand, you have that very muscular statement, we will hold the bank's feet to the fire, and using that hackneyed phrase, hard-working families across the country go, yay. And then you also have the notion that the government was considering a very high rate of VAT, up to 20%. So aren't people left very confused? Um, is the government their friend? Is the government going to punish them? They don't know. Well, on the VAT, I think uh, Gordon Brown made it very clear at um, PMQs that um, there is absolutely no plan to, to raise VAT. So that is something that I think the public have been reassured about. In fact, there has been a VAT cut um, until um, next year. And I think that um, the important thing is that the you know, increased investment in terms of state and taxpayers' money um, for the banks, which um, is trying to get us out of this crisis, is acted upon by those banks. Um, at the end of the day, we need to get the economy going again that means that small businesses need banks to lend to them and if the banks are not doing that it is absolutely within the right of the government and and Mervyn King who said that you know we may have to consider nationalization if the banks do not make a move on this now the government has set up a, a lending um, panel which is being chaired by by Peter Mandelson in order to understand the difficulties that the banks themselves are facing so it's not all about sort of saying you know we want to beat the banks and, until they do it it's trying to come to an understanding about how best to make them do it but at the end of the day you know consumers expect that when the, when the government you know uses um, state funding in order to get the economy going again that they actually do actually wield some force on their behalf okay all right thank you for that um, as promised though now more details on that top political story of the day the arrest of the Tory immigration spokesman Damien Green over leaked information from the Home Office so the question is is the Home Office full of gossips who like nothing better than a good old natter across the garden fence well this story centers on four issues which are now being investigated one involves a leak over 5,000 illegal immigrants working in the Home Office oh. Then, of course, there was the story that the Home Office had hired a cleaner who was an illegal immigrant. 
Then there was speculation that someone had leaked the lowdown on the Labour rebels who might just vote against 42 days. Oh my! And finally, a leaked memo from the Home Secretary to the Prime Minister warning that a recession could lead to a rise in violent crime and burglaries. Never! Oh yes, last night the police carted Mr Green off to the police station to find out exactly what he knew. The Tories have called the arrest, and there it is, Stalin-esque. Well, David Davis is with us now, the former Shadow Home Secretary. Um, what's going on? It's very hard to know. I mean, it, it could be anything from a grotesque, almost monumental error of judgment on the one hand, through to a piece of sort of judicial intimidation. If they'd applied this rule, these laws, as it were, uh, they're applying now in the 1930s, they'd have locked up Winston Churchill. Uh, he'd have been a prisoner, not the Prime Minister, because he was given leaked information about the weakness of the country's defences. Much more sensitive than what we're talking about here. Yeah, are you going and, to... And he, and he properly, but he quite properly decided it was in the public interest to yeah. put that in the public domain. He did so. Nobody locked him up. Well, I mean, we, we were talking about the Churchillian example, but there are, there are some which have been less heroic, mm. if you like, mm. over the years. And I'm, I'm sure you're not arguing that everybody is free to leak at any time. I mean, no. it, it, no. what's, the, what's the point of having processes and procedures no. if that's the case? No, exactly. And uh, there is, but there is a, a question of public interest. I mean, when I was Shadow Home Secretary, I used to get a lot of information come to me from, from all sorts of places. And less than half of it made it in the public domain, partly because some looked sensitive, partly because some of it was just unnecessary to put in the public domain. Uh, you made a public interest judgment. Now, take one of those examples you had there, the, the uh, 5,000 illegal immigrants who were given um, the right to be security guards. Some of them actually ended up guarding the Prime Minister's car. That seemed to us to be a very in sensible, important thing to put in the public domain, and we knew. What actually got in the public domain was that the Home Office was trying to prevent it getting out into public. I, I can hear that you and others of your party are very unhappy about this, but the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be applying for information under the Freedom of Information Act? How far are you going to Oh, well, there'll be a whole other thing. I mean, there are various issues in, uh, in play. One is, when did the ministers know about it? You know. Now, first thing we know, I mean, they've been very disingenuous. The original request for this investigation came from the Home Office, say, from civil servants, they say. Well, are they telling us that the Home Secretary didn't know that request was being made? When did the Home Secretary herself know? I mean, I would have been furious if I was Home Secretary and the police had gone and arrested a member of the opposition uh, on this sort of charge. I would, have, I would have said, you didn't tell me first? It's, I mean, it's very interesting you say that. We've managed to coax uh, Tony Lloyd, I'm delighted to say, to stay with us um, for, for a little longer. And it does beg a belief, doesn't it, Mr Lloyd, that Boris Johnson should have been tipped off that this was going to happen, but the Home Secretary didn't know, nobody around her knew that this was going to happen. How is that even possible? Well, we have to be very careful because, you see, D David Davis, in, in, in saying some of the things he said, will probably carry at least large support across um, the parliamentary system. The, the, the police have to be very clear as to why they took the actions they did. They may have reasons, and I simply don't know the answer to that. But certainly it is very uh, unusual, unprecedented, to see um, a, a Member of Parliament arrested uh, uh, in, in this way. So that certainly is something the police have got to answer. Where I think it's on slightly less happy ground is this innuendo that we need to know when ministers knew. Because, of course, actually, if we do respect the independence of the police, one, it doesn't matter when ministers knew, because ministers should not interfere. And the second part of it is whether David is actually suggesting that ministers not only knew, but tried to influence the situation, because that's a very, very serious charge. I think rather than hiding behind innuendo, we need very clear allegations of what's being said about so, the role of ministers. So far, let, well, let's, let's be clear about this. If, it, if it, is, it is unimportant what ministers knew and what they didn't, uh, to your knowledge, did the ministers know or did they not know? Well, I, I've seen both uh, Gordon Brown's statement saying that he only knew after when he was informed by the permanent secretary. And, and like you and your listeners, I, uh, I watched Jackie Smith a few moments ago saying what she said. So I've got to take those at face value, okay. unless, unless somebody, you or others, are prepared to stand up and say ministers knew more than they're now saying. No, I'm prepared to stand up and read you a, a statement from the Home Office, though. Let me, let me read you this instead. It's from Sir David Normington, permanent mm -hmm. secretary to the Home Office, just come to us. The Home Office has suffered a number of leaks of sensitive information over an extended period. Due to the nature of our business, this was clearly a matter of serious concern in that it risked undermining the effective operation of my department. I therefore rec requested police assistance in trying to identify the sources of these leaks. The police investigation led to a junior member of the Home Office being arrested on the 19th of November and subsequently suspended from duty. Yesterday I was informed by the Met Police at about 1.45pm that a search was about to be conducted at the home, of home and offices of a member of the opposition front bench. I was subsequently told that an arrest had been made. Ministers were not 
involved in that decision to seek police assistance or in the subsequent investigation they were only told of the arrest after it had occurred there is an ongoing police investigation it would be inappropriate to comment any further so we have a very categoric statement there from the permanent secretary at the home office mm. they didn't know about it they weren't involved well so we told the other thing we haven't heard of is how the whole uh, investigation was initiated uh, and there was a story this morning, I don't know what, uh, what the uh, genesis of it was, that it was initiated by civil servants in the Home Office, very specifically said of civil servants. These are things that embarrass ministers. These are things that ministers wanted to keep quiet. That was actually the, what the documents were said that were put in the public domain. Now, you know, that's, you know, it's one thing to say you're undermining the operation of the Home Office. Fine, I agree, you've got to protect that. But do you have to protect ministers keeping things out of the public domain? But, but and, you... and, and, and in yeah. particular, as, to, as Tony himself said, you know, we're talking here about a wholly unprecedented action, that of arresting a member of parliament. Not under the Official Secrets Act. There are no, there's no national security issue here. There's no national intelligence issue here. There's no threat but, to but the Mr. public But Mr Davis, by, by the indignity that you are, are, are sounding uh, today, are you suggesting that ministers are not telling the truth, that this is indeed a politicised well, act? I mean, what, do you, what do you suggest? Unlike, what are you unlike, saying? No, no, I, unlike Mr Lloyd, I'm not, you know, I'm not about sort of making allegations without facts. We will ask for the facts. We, we'll, we will have a freedom of information request on each stage of this process. I actually think the, the Home Secretary ought to come to the House of Commons next week and explain what's going on, because this is a massive intrusion on House of Commons privilege. The House of Commons is there to inquire into what the government does and hold it accountable. Okay. Not to make assertions, to inquire and hold it accountable. When the government withholds information, it has a right to use whatever information it gets uh, to, hold them to, to hold them to account. Now, that's what Dominic, uh, sorry, that's what Damien uh, Green has done. That is his job and he's been arrested for doing his job. Can you not see that actually that's really quite, uh, okay. quite intimidating? Well, we have, we have in, in the last Parliament. few seconds of the programme, uh, last word with you. Uh, just tell me, Tony, do you think that a lot more is going to come out, Tony Lloyd, uh, about this story? It's very, very hard to say. I, I think what must come out, obviously, is, is the police account of, of why they took the actions they did. That really must not be a matter okay. for politicians. All right, thank you very much indeed, both of you. That is all for this week. We're off air now until next Thursday. I hope you miss us.